All right. Hi, everybody. Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, this is a little project that we did in Albert Park uh, for a long-standing client of ours, and they bought the property with the intent to sell it. So it was a commercial project, but also one where there was a high demand of uh, on the actual design itself. And um, it's located in Albert Park. And I suppose with this context photo, I just I, I always think Melbourne is a big city and it actually changes a lot a lot from suburb to suburb. And I think that that is reflected in um, the breadth of the work that we do. And this is very much a contextual project for its location. It was an Edwardian, single-fronted Edwardian cottage um, that is, I mean, Albert Park is actually full of a lot of architectural houses, some of them um, louder than others. And, um, you know, just a couple of doors up, there is actually quite a large extension to, to an adjoining property. Um, and I think we're interested, especially in housing, that it's actually where we're, we're not necessarily creating objects, we're creating spaces for people to live in. And it's okay for residential architecture to be a little bit quiet in its context, um, in base form. I mean, our background as a practice is very much in residential and, uh, sorry, multi-residential. And sometimes all we can do is create space. Um, and, and that's, so there's a real focus in the practice. And I think the more that we do housing, the more important that becomes. Um, we've got uh, a renovator's desire. It really was quite disgusting and there wasn't much opportunity to keep it um, because of heritage and, and all, actually the front house of the site had good proportions. So keeping the front two bedrooms and then knocking off the rear. One of the things that came up after our client purchased it is that there actually was an easement that went along the side of the site and through to the back of the site that wasn't obvious on the sales documents. So we were able to um, claim that easement back from council, which actually gave us the opportunity to really add some width to the project, just in its context. So it was one of a pigeon pair. Um, that's the large extension that's, that you can see in that previous photo. Um, so I suppose in some ways these projects are the easiest and the hardest for architects because site area is at an absolute premium and you ultimately end up putting a box on the back of these terraces because you need to, you need to have as much real estate as you possibly can. And we felt that we wanted, you know, we, we had to do that, but it was also how could we actually make this thing go together a little bit like a Japanese wood, wood puzzle? Um, because the other thing that we're interested in a practice is this idea of creating spaces that are very clean and open and that have a real legibility. I think when you go into houses, you want them to feel really balanced. And so you, you know, especially when you have a, a historical or a, a heritage building with a new extension, you need them to be balanced aesthetically, but not referential, but you also need the spaces to feel balanced. And we didn't want them to feel too cluttered because one of the things that's also really nice about terraces, general, like the, the front rooms of terraces, they're large, generous spaces, but there's a lot of hardware and stuff you've got to get into these projects to make them work. So I'll just, um, the key to this plan is this, these blue areas on both levels where we actually put all the services and all the intensity of the plan and use that as a way of linking new and old. Um, and the bathrooms and the design of the bathrooms was really critical to um, making this work. Because I think the other thing you get in terraces, you do two bedrooms, you put in a bathroom and you lose all your living area. And we really wanted to make sure that those bathrooms were doing as much as they possibly could. So we could keep the plan as short as possible. So we could really maximize the living area at the rear. So in this plan here, you can see we've got a bathroom shower, but we've actually kept a little powder room. So you walk through the powder room to get to the wet room. Um, the water tank is hidden here between the front and the back of the house. The laundry sits back in this little corner area. And upstairs, we've got a wet room off the ensuite. The um, uh, vanity sits in the corridor. So once again, we're trying to just make it so that you're reading the big spaces, not just little rooms um, within the the thing within the, the floor plate. Um, so three bedrooms, so this just to orientate. North is actually across to the right. It's a really strange orientation. Um, the other thing we did in this was just making sure that all we wanted to maximize storage, but we didn't want it to become, um, you know, 
a, a large part of the sort of visual clutter. So we've really got really long walls of storage that have hidden desks in them, fridges, appliance cupboards, etc. But they're also um, located so as you walk into rooms, they're not you're not necessarily looking at them. The other, um, it's funny, I was listening to Grafton Architects at the conference on um, Saturday and they said, you know, light is free and what we do really is manipulate light. And that really resonated with me and it is something that we did on this project. So um, obviously the other issue with uh, these terraces is they are pretty much landlocked. So we had existing light with existing windows, which was great. Um, we were able to introduce light from another, uh, other windows throughout the plan. So into the bathroom, main background, main um, rear windows and the side. And then we added a number of skylights. So there was always diffused light coming from above. And then we selected materials where the light, um, so this is the overall plan. So first of all, there was always light somewhere in the plan, but selected materials so that the light um, reflected off them to create texture. Um, you know, when you talk about, people talk about sculptures and they talk that they are actually exercises in light and shadow. And that's something that we tried to do here on the interior of this house. So this is a, a view uh, from the back looking, looking towards the, the front of the site. So this is the laundry. So once again, no door on the laundry, the idea of the long um, extended joinery diffused light at the end. And also these, um, so these wet areas have a shared language of a sort of stone surround. Um, as you come from the front of the site, can you see my mouse? Yeah. Uh, as you come from the front of the site, what we did is we pushed the building down so that we could maximise the height and so we could avoid strange setbacks onto the side boundary. But the other thing that does is it creates a lovely progression as you come through to the rear of the site. And I really love changes in level because I think that they create a pause point where you can appreciate the spaces. So the design of the spaces is very much to accentuate that. One minute remaining. Oh shit. Okay, uh, stair, light from the stairs. So these are just a whole series of images that talk about um, how that light is managed within the property. Bathroom downstairs with light from the side. So we used a three dimensional tile and the, bath, the um, bathrooms. The link between the front and the rear. Timber batten screen to create privacy, but also filter the light into the bathroom, bedroom. Ensuite, wet room to the left. Main bedroom upstairs, so we used a glazed screen once again so that you could read the whole space. Um, so there was this feeling of generosity, but then the curtain allows you to close it off and desk to the left. And these are just a few, um, we were just so lucky with the builder we had here, just the quality of detailing we got. This was built for, for just on a million dollars. So, and the whole thing was basically rebuilt. 